Hello everybody, my name is Laura Hillekes and I'm Michael Ostege. And today we'd like to present to you our work on Calibrate, a Python package for nonlinear calibration and multi-level modeling. We are PhD students at the Forschungszentrum Jülich. Our work specializes in the intersection between laboratory automation, bioprocess development and Bayesian statistics. In our talk, we'd like to guide you through the data generating process of a biochemical assay and show you how you can use our package Calibrate to generate error models and do quantitative data analysis. Furthermore, we will show how error models built with Calibrate can be combined with PyMC3 as likelihood functions for multi-level and hierarchical modeling. What we usually do in biotechnology is that when we want to come up with an industrial production process, we use biological systems, for example microorganisms, to convert renewable carbon sources into value products, which could be detergents, drugs or food additives. And in an industrial process, we use large-scale bioreactors for this. Now, when developing such a process, we need to optimize the various steps of the process. So, for example, we could optimize which microorganisms we use and their genetic variability. Um, we can also optimize the different substrates and process conditions, so we easily get a high combinatorial diversity. So in order to rank all those different candidates for the process, we need to define an optimization objective. And in biotechnology, this is often a concentration, a yield or formation rate. And what all of those have in common is that we need to quantify the amount of product that we produce. Now, bringing this into practice, let's um, consider a little thought example where we have four different candidate processes and we want to rank them by which one has the fastest product formation. So in this little graphic here uh, where the kinetics, kinetics are shown, uh, this will be the slope. Now, in order to determine the kinetics, we need to take samples of each of those candidates at different time points. So here we have eight samples. So in total, we would have 32 samples. And what we can do now is we can measure those to quantify how much product we have at each time step. And with a little bit of Python magic and also using PyMT3, for example, we could come up again with a product formation rate, so our performance indicator and an uncertainty for our indicator. Well, going on with this thought experiment, let's now imagine that our product would be an amino acid, for example, glycine. And as I said, we have four candidates, so we have four independent time series that we want to characterize and each um, has eight samples. We have to come up then with the measurement method to quantify a product. And in the case of an amino acid, this could be a photometric chemical assay. What is this? Um, well, the problem is we can often not measure this amin amino acids directly. So we use the so-called ninhydrin assay. The substance down here, ninhydrin, is uh, reacting with the amino acid to form a dark blue reaction product. And this blue dye, we can now measure by absorbance in a so-called photometer. So here we have a possibility to quantify the amount of product we have. Now putting this together in the big picture, how can we quantify product formation for our ranking? Well, we already said we need to take samples and when we have them, we now have already seen with the biochemical assay, we have a quantification method. So the missing step here that we still need to do is now we need a process model that can describe the kinetics. So in the end, we can infer from this uh, the parameter of interest, the product formation rate. But wait, if you think about it, um, do we really already have all the steps that we can already go into the process model? Well, for this process model, we need to compare um, our measurements with the predictions and those are concentrations. But as I said, we measure indeed absorbance from a photometer. So what's missing here, what we still need to do is that we need to come up with a calibration of this chemical assay with standards of known concentration. And then we need to come up with a regression model that is describing this input output relationship. So the relationship between the concentration of the amino acid and the absorbance that we measure in the end. So let's have a look at this process here. So how we come up with a regression model. Well, from now on, when we talk about um, the inputs, so the concentrations that we want to find out in the end, we will talk about the independent variable. And when we talk about the absorbance or so observation, we will talk about the dependent variable. 
And because we know not all people here are familiar with such kind of biochemical assays, we want to now guide you through this data generating process. So how we get um, the absorbance measurement in the end in this small video. So what we do here is first we add 20 microliters of sample from, uh, from each of our different time points. And as a next step, we um, also add now 20 microliters of our assay reagent, the ninhydrin. The reaction can then take, take place. And you can see here this now in the first column, there's already the blue dye forming. And now in this fast forward video, you can see how the reaction is taking place and a lot of dye is formed. After a defined uh, period of time, the reaction is stopped by adding 160 microliter of water to each uh, of those small reaction chambers. So after this, we now have our blue product in a certain concentration and we can measure this plate and get absorbance values for each reaction chamber. So what we have to take into account now that we've seen the data generating process is that either if we do it with known standards or with our samples in the end, um, those measurements and the whole process is subject to multiple sources of noise. So for example, this could be that we have um, like error-prone piping of volumes or the device itself could have um, different errors. So what we need now is not only a simple calibration, but we should come up with a model that describes the trend between input and output, but also we should model the noise. So how can we do this coming now to the data side? Well, we already have the data. We saw this in the data generating process. Next, we should uh, bring this into a format that we can use in Python. So for example, we can read it into Pandas data frames. And then what's always a first good step is we should plot the raw data. And down here, you now see the relation between absorbance and uh, our standards of known concentration, also here with the logarithmic uh, x-axis. So on first sight, we could think now for a model of the trend, maybe this is um, a linear model. And you can see there's some random fluctuation. So maybe we can assume um, a constant noise or maybe a linear increasing noise. Now, how can we uh, formalize this process a bit? Um, what we in Calibrate do is that we uh, consider this model of trend function and model of noise together as so-called error models. So here you would see an example for an error model. You see by this solid line here in green that there's a trend describing the relationship between independent and dependent variable. And for the noise, we assume a distribution, for example, normal distribution. So how do we get this uh, trend and noise? Well, we can insert our calibration data. So for this, we know both the independent and the dependent variables. And we can, um, if we assume for the noise, for example, um, a normal distribution, we can come up with a likelihood. So we can optimize this until we get the trend function and noise function that um, ideally describe this or that nicely describe the calibration data. And what's great now about those error models is that we can derive from this, once we have the model, both a distribution of the measurement outcomes. So if we insert the um, a value for the true input, we get a whole distribution for this uh, dependent variable. And the other way around, if we use the model inversely, we can um, condition on the observation. So we give one or several observations and we get an, a distribution for the true input. So that means how certain we can be about the true concentration. And this now we, uh, we will get by using Calibrate and in the following we will show you how you can easily do this use, using our Python package. So let's take a look at a concrete example. In most cases, error models do not have to be implemented from scratch. Instead, they can inherit from one of the base models from Calibrate. In this case, we are inheriting from a base class that has this suffix t. This stands for student t distribution, describing the noise. We found that in practice, this does not only account for outliers, but is also more numerically stable and easier to work with in optimization and sense. To implement the error model for the ninhydrin assay in our application example, we inherit from the base polynomial model T, so we can model the trend as a first order polynomial and the noise as a constant. 
After instantiation of the model, we can use convenience functions such as fit scipy from calibrate to fit the model against calibration values. We have to provide an initial guess for the parameter vector and also bounds for the model parameters. After fitting, we can call the plot model convenience function to get a plot of our fit. Here we can see that our assumption of linearity does not hold and also the assumption of constant noise does not match well with the data. Instead of a linear model, we can use a five-parameter asymmetric logistic function to model the trend as a function of the logarithm of the independent variable. The five-parameter asymmetric logistic function is parameterized by a lower and upper saturation limit, an inflection point, the slope at the inflection point, and an asymmetry parameter that moves the inflection point between the limits. This way we can account for nonlinear trends and saturation of the measurement system. In this case, we model the scale parameter of the noise as a first order polynomial function from the mean. The model is fitted in the same way as before, and we can see that now it fits much better to our data. Every calibrate error model has a predict dependent method that predicts the parameters of the probability distribution that describes the dependent variable. We can use this to get an idea about the mean that we would expect given a certain independent variable. But the trend function is also invertible, so we can use predict independent to predict the independent variable from an observation. Every calibrate error model implements a log likelihood method that is compatible with both single and multiple observations. The log likelihood method is not only used for maximum likelihood estimation of the model parameters, but also for the infer independent method. With infer independent, you can get a posterior density from one or multiple observations. You have to specify a lower and upper limit, which corresponds to a uniform prior. The intuition behind this is that when conditioning on one observation, this is essentially the cut like this, and conditioning on multiple observations is equivalent to the product of these three densities. The result is returned as a posterior object with properties such as x-dense and PDF. These properties can directly be used for plotting. We can now apply the Ninhydrin error model to the samples from our application example. We had four time series, each with eight samples positioned here in the right of our microtiter plate. Looking at the raw absorbance values, we can see this upwards trend. With the infer independent method, we can get posterior distributions for every single observation. So to summarize this part, calibrate models account for nonlinearity and noise, and we get posterior densities instead of point estimates. Also, they are flexible with respect to the number of observations. Furthermore, the predict dependent and log likelihood methods of calibrate error models are fully compatible with Theano and therefore also with PyMC3. They can be differentiated and compiled to C functions. This way, they can be used with any kind of modeling. In the example shown here, we have the pure NumPy SciPy implementation, but also an implementation that creates a compiled function for the log likelihood of our error model. This is done by creating Theano tensor variables for the independent and dependent variable. These tensor variables are given into the log likelihood method, which then returns a Theano tensor variable. Using Theano function, we can compile a Python callable that calculates the log likelihood based on the inputs x and y. This compiled implementation is five to 10 times faster than the pure NumPy SciPy implementation above. So far, we saw how calibrate error models make it easy to do univariate calibration while accounting for uncertainty, prediction and inference of sample concentrations from single or multiple observations becomes a lot easier and more robust. Next, we will look into the coupling of calibrate with PyMC3 to do Bayesian inference of process model parameters. In our application example, we have four time series 
of eight samples each. We expect a linear increase with unknown product formation rate or slope and an unknown intercept, which is common for all of these four. This is a multi-level linear regression problem that can easily be modeled with PyMC3. For this application example, the multi-level linear regression can be implemented as a single PyMC3 deterministic variable. It is simply the sum of intercept with slope times time point. By providing the dimension names, we do not only specify the shape, but also make sure that the inference data will be easier to work with. So now let's jump into the code. After loading our data into a data frame, we can instantiate the error model from the save file. For the definition of the PyMC3 model, we will pass coordinates. This makes it easier to associate the dimensions in the sampling result. The multi-level regression requires an intercept and a slope. The intercept corresponds to the initial product concentration of the experiment. The slope in this case corresponds to the product formation rate. Because we have four time series, we name the dimensions as group, which means that we will have a slope variable with size four. The time and absorbance variables are passed into PyMC3 data containers. This way they are also kept into the inference data, which we will get back from the sampling. Furthermore, they are reshaped to be of dimension time point times group, which makes it easier to do the prediction in a single line. Here we have to do a bit of the Anno tensor variable slicing, so the element-wise operations work out. Again, the shapes are named with the dimensions. The prediction is passed into the log likelihood method of our error model. Alongside the prediction, we have to pass the observations. This single call to the log likelihood method constructs the computation graph for making the observations. Finally, we can create and plot this new PyMC3 model. Now we can hit the inference button and sample this multi-level regression model with NUTS. We specify return inference data, so we already get back the RV's object from the sampling. Here we can see that the posterior now has named coordinates, chain, draw, group, and time point. So also the product concentrations have these named dimensions now. We can make a trace plot with RVs to inspect our MCMC chains. Also, we can use plot forest from RVs to take a look at our product formation rate estimates. Finally, we can use the helper function plot gpdist from PyMC3 to make a nice plot of our posterior densities for the product concentration over time as predicted by our multi-level regression model. So now that we've seen the code demonstration in Jupyter Notebook, let's summarize what we've learned so far about Calibrate. Calibrate error models can serve as calibration curves for all those lab scientists who want to do their data analysis the Pythonic way. And at the same time, they can be used as flexible, fast, and differentiable likelihood functions for modeling. So we've demonstrated this with PyMC3 process models, and you could see how the likelihood methods can be used in a plug and play fashion. And at the same time, they closely mimic the real data generating process. So coming back to the thought example we had at the beginning, from those four different candidates, one was clearly the best concerning product formation rate. And although we faced several nonlinearities in the measurement of absorbance, we could easily handle this because we used an error model for this calibration. Of course, this kind of kinetics was a fairly easy example. So let's get a bit beyond this and see what else we could do using error models. Well, another common example would be that we don't measure just one dilution, but maybe several. So what we could do to handle this would that we simply set up two different error models and calibrate them with standards for both dilutions. And then we could plug in both into our process model. We are using two different likelihood methods. 
And this now allows us to incorporate both information and uncertainty for multiple different observation methods at the same time, which is very nice for, on, for our analysis. Going even beyond this, maybe we don't just observe one product, but several and maybe also the substrate. So what would we need in this case? Well, first of all, we need predictions for our observables. So there we need another model, which could be a differential equation, for example. But then we set up again different error models and use the log likelihood method. And we can put in those predictions here into our log likelihood and then handle those different predictions at the same time. So here you see that Calibrate is very modular. And to sum up this whole talk, you, we hopefully could show you how Calibrate provides a generalizable framework and however you call it now, univariate calibration, error modeling, observation functions or likelihood functions, this is applicable to many different cases. We also showed how you can incorporate nonlinear relationships and because this is handled externally in the error model, you don't overcomplicate your process model, but you do this in another step. And finally, because this is so modular in the plug and play fashion, you can account for various sources of data heterogeneity. We hope you enjoyed our talk. Thank you for taking interest in our Python package Calibrate and Invasion Error Modeling. You can find us on both Twitter and GitHub, where you will also find the link to the paper and code. And now we are looking forward to the Q&A on the PyMC discourse.